how do we get a healthy gut? How do we care for our guts? How do we create the healthiest gut possible? And within most communities, within most nutritional circles now, the answer to that question is more fiber, predominantly more fiber from vegetables. This is where I begin to have significant disagreements with the mainstream pundits in the nutrition space. Because I don't think that vegetable fiber is a necessary thing for a healthy gut at all. And think, in fact, conversely, that most vegetable fiber is going to damage your gut and cause issues. People who argue for vegetable fiber as a critical component of a healthy diet for your gut are looking at either alpha diversity, and they're not looking at interventional studies, as I will show you, and they're looking at things like short chain fatty acids and butyrate, which we know are important for the colonic, the end of your gut, the large intestine, the colonic epithelial cells, the colonic enterocytes use short chain fatty acids like butyrate. Well, as you'll hear in a moment, butyrate isn't exclusive to vegetable fibers. We can make butyrate from fruit fibers. We can probably make butyrate from honey. We can even make short chain fatty acids that appear to have the same effects in the gut as butyrate, like isobutyrate, acetate, propionate, maybe even succinate from things like protein in our diet. So there are lots of ways that you can make short chain fatty acids in your diet other than vegetable fiber. And I strongly debate and I strongly oppose the notion that vegetable fiber is the key or even necessary or even beneficial for the human gut in any way, shape or form. So why have we been told for so long that vegetable fiber is the answer? Like so many places where Western medicine and mainstream nutrition has gone wrong, these assertions are based on epidemiology. They're based on observational studies Studies comparing Italian children in the cities to kids in Burkina Faso, which are much more rural. And what they find is that kids in rural areas eat more fiber, but they have a greater alpha diversity in their gut. Well, what we find when we do interventional studies, which must always be done to test the hypotheses generated from observational studies, we can't end at interventional studies like um, so many nutritional authorities would want us to. We must test them in interventional studies. When we do interventional studies with fiber, what we find is that giving humans more fiber doesn't change the alpha diversity of the human gut, meaning doesn't create more diversity in the gut. But I can't tell you how often I hear parroted the notion that eating the rainbow or eating more diverse plant foods equals a more diverse microbiome, and that is good. But I've never seen a single interventional study to support that notion. I've only seen epidemiology, which is always disproven when we look at interventional studies. So let's look at a couple of those. I've spoken about this study a number of times recently. It's from Justin Sonnenberg's lab. It's from Justin Sonnenberg's lab at um, Stanford. And the title of the study is Gut Microbiota Targeted Diets Modulate Human Immune Status. Okay. Um, it should have been called Plant Fiber Does Nothing for Alpha Diversity, but Fermented Foods Do. But that isn't what they called it. <laughs> So if you look here, what they did was they had a 17-week randomized protect perspective study designed, and they also looked at omics, which is a complex method of looking at the uh, types of bacteria in the gut, and they looked at the microbiome and the host. They did extensive immune profiling, and they found distinct effects of each diet. Well, what diets were they doing? They had a plant-based fiber, a vegan type of diet, or fermented foods. Unfortunately, I couldn't convince Justin to do an animal-based diet. That's a joke. Uh, I wasn't in contact with Justin before the study, but I wish he had reached out to me because I would have loved to have seen an animal-based diet arm, maybe even with some kefir. But I suspect, I wouldn't be surprised if their hypothesis was that a plant-based fiber diet was going to be beneficial for the gut microbiota with whatever metrics they were using, alpha diversity, et cetera. What they found was that when they did the studies, the plant fiber-based diet did nothing for the alpha diversity. But alternatively, the high fermented food diet steadily increased microbiota diversity and decreased inflammatory markers. This did not happen at all. High fiber consumers showed increased gut microbiota and coated glycan degrading CAZ enzymes despite stable community diversity. That basically means the alpha diversity didn't change at all when they gave more plant fiber, as I've said many times in the past, but they had more enzymes that degrade plant fiber. Well, no shit. If you eat more plant fiber, your gut is going to adjust and you're gonna have more enzymes in there that degrade plant fiber. But 
from an immunologic perspective, the fermented food diet improved inflammatory markers and immune markers, while the plant-based fiber diet could do nothing. I know that my friend, Andrew Huberman, has talked to Justin Sonnenberg about this on his podcast. He was actually one of the people that first sent me this study, but I don't understand why this hasn't been more talked about in the general nutritional world because it basically disproves the notion that you should be fueled by fiber, <laughs> that plant fiber is going to do anything beneficial for your gut from an immunologic, inflammatory, or alpha diversity perspective. What does improve gut diversity? Fermented foods. Where do we find fermented foods on an animal-based diet? You are going to get fermented foods from kefir. Who needs beer when you can have kefir, right? It's something that I eat every day. You can see me eating my breakfast every single day on Instagram, carnivoremd2.0. You're also going to get quote unquote natural probiotics from raw dairy, which is one of the reasons I enjoy raw dairy. I use raw milk from cows or goats to make kefir. And I do raw butter and raw cheeses. All of those are going to essentially be sources of environmental, quote unquote, natural probiotics. It's not surprising they improve the alpha diversity, inflammatory markers, and immune markers in the gut in that controlled study from Justin Sonnenberg's lab. Other sources of fermented foods, as they mentioned in the study, are things like kombucha. I would be careful of kombuchas that contain large amounts of unfermented sugar. In fact, kombucha is usually made by adding processed sugar. And as I will show you later, processed sugar, at least in animal models, can be very detrimental to the gut. So I don't think you should be using processed sugar. In contrast, honey does have many things which can be beneficial for the gut. I'll show you evidence for that later in the podcast. You might even consider honey a fermented food because I believe, maybe some beekeepers out there will correct me on this, but I believe that honey is made in the stomach, in the GI tracts of bees through a process of fermentation. So you might even consider honey to be in ways a fermented food. Kombucha, kefir, raw cheeses, perhaps even yogurts. My problem with a lot of yogurt is they contain processed sugars. They're often pasteurized. I'm not as big a fan of yogurt. It's very hard to find high quality yogurt if you make your own, great. But I think that fermented dairy is a good place to begin with those things. What about fermented sauerkraut? Okay, it's probably better than nothing, but remember that you are fermenting a cabbage, which is a brassica type of plant, which has defense chemicals, isothiocyanates. Those are mostly degraded when you ferment it, but you are taking a plant that is, I believe, toxic to humans, has plant defense chemicals. They are degraded somewhat by the fermentation process, but I still don't think it's the best use of that plant or the best source of fermented foods. I would rather have an animal food that is fermented than a plant food that is fermented in my diet. I'm not a huge fan of kimchi because it has the capsicum spices. As I've talked about in the past, those do appear to open tight junctions in cell culture. I will show you evidence for that in this podcast. These are the hot peppers. Even sweet peppers do the same thing. So spicy foods, not good for your gut. Kimchi, I don't think it's good for your gut. That's why it hurts when you poop it out, guys. And sauerkraut, I think there are much better sources of fermented foods. And most of the sauerkraut I've seen, is just a joke in grocery stores. It's basically just cabbage, soggy cabbage with vinegar. Why would you eat that? Maybe if you got a really, really good pickle. But again, the quality of these in terms of mass production is very poor. If you make your own, perhaps, but I think lacto-fermented dairy is the best choice. And I suspect most people, many people who have a sensitivity to dairy will do better with raw dairy. In fact, I was talking with a colleague, Stefan Van Vliet, recently. We are going to be collaborating. This is super exciting news, guys. We're going to be collaborating on a pilot, randomized, controlled trial in the near future, funded by the newly incorporated Animal Based Nutrition Research Foundation. More information on that forthcoming. We're going to do it at Utah State University. They have a Center for Nutrition Clinical Studies, and we're going to give patients an animal based diet. But we were talking about the benefits of raw dairy, and he was saying that he wants to do a study looking at raw dairy versus conventional dairy. We'd love to see that study too. He also was interested in the differences between those two types of foods. I think there's a big difference there, though we probably will have trouble using large amounts of raw dairy in our study on an animal-based diet. We probably can get raw cheese into it. There are other studies that have essentially shown the same thing as Justin Sonnenberg's study. This one is from Harvard University, interestingly, and they gave patients a fully meat-based diet compared to a plant-based diet. Title of this study, Diet Rapidly and Reproducibly Alters the Human Gut Microbiome. This is from Nature. 
2014, what they found in the study was that the alpha diversity did not change at all when patients had zero plant fiber. In fact, the alpha diversity, which you can see at the end of this paper, was about the same in both of the studies, though the beta diversity improved or increased on a carnivore diet. They say no significant differences in alpha diversity were detected on either diet, which means that when they gave more plant fiber to these study participants, there was no increase in alpha diversity. And when they decreased plant fiber significantly, there was no, uh, there was no decrease. So you can see here, here is fiber intake on the plant-based diet. It goes up significantly. Here it goes down significantly on the carnivore diet. The fat intake goes down on the plant-based diet, but goes up on the animal-based diet, which is actually a carnivore diet. So it's different than how I would define an animal-based diet. Protein goes down on the plant-based diet. Protein goes up on the carnivore diet. Alpha diversity, essentially no significant change on either of these diets. A plant-based diet did not increase alpha diversity, as so many would claim, and a carnivore diet did not decrease alpha diversity. Carnivore diet did increase beta diversity, which is something that not a lot of people have commented on, but beta diversity is a ratio between regional and local species diversity. It's probably not worth getting that much in the weeds uh, at this point with regard to this study. It's just another one to illustrate the fact that plant-based fiber doesn't give you a very diverse gut. And removing fiber doesn't decrease the diversity of your gut. What does increase the diversity of your gut? Fermented foods. And I would also suggest that you can increase the diversity of your gut by being in nature. 